Microphone number one, please. Go ahead. Hi, Jeff Craig. Hi, Jeff Craddock, Town of Devon. Uh, we just, this is towards Rick McGiver, Minister Rick McGiver, Honorable. Um, I'm curious about a comment that was given yesterday by the Premier, and this is just for explanation. It came out about the controlling the mill rate, and I believe she might have been talking about school rates. It didn't come across to many of us as that clear, and I'm wondering if you have any insight as to the province looking after that, because if you guys looked after all of the mill rate, what do you need us for? Okay, uh, thank you, Jeff. I, I guess I don't really pretend to know all of the deepest inner thoughts of the Premier, but I heard the same thing you did yesterday, and I'll do my best to answer your question. Uh, I think part of that was about uh, uh, what's charged, what, what are the mill rate is for education. Uh, part of that, and I don't, we set what we need for education and you folks set what you need for your individual municipalities. But I think the part you might be talking about, there seemed to, the conversation seemed to drift into who collects the property tax. Yes? That's, okay, you're nodding. Okay. Yep. Um, and the Premier kind of left the door open to talk about it. And it's, it's uh, at, at one point, Somebody said, well, wouldn't it be nicer if the tax bill came from the province instead of the municipality? Or a lot of people cheered, which kind of surprised me because I kind of thought municipalities might want to keep control of that. I understand it's work, it's expense, and when you send the tax bills with the city or municipal logo on it, you get the blame, if, if you will, when people don't like the number that's on the other side of the, the page. So I don't think anything's been decided. I, I think uh, somewhere the conversation seem to drift into who might collect the taxes for both sides in the future and I don't think anything was promised or decided but the, uh, the Premier's a better person than I am. She starts at yes and then looks for an answer, a reason to say no. I usually start at no and look for a reason to convince me to yes so I, I think that's the major difference and I just think her mind is generally open to new ideas. Thank you. Microphone number two, please. Go ahead. Hi there. Thank you. Chris Zember, Head Counselor, Town of Redcliffe. The recently announced accelerator program is a little cloudy for our situation. Oh, and this is for the Education Minister, by the way. As a council, we had a split vote to accept a renovation on an existing 66-year-old school if truly it is take that or nothing. I might add this proposed renovation will add zero capacity to our school. However, we have a unanimous voice for our council that we would much prefer a brand new school rather than putting lipstick on a pig, so to say. I personally took Danielle's speech as we were to get a new school, as she did mention, have the site ready and we will build it. If in our situation it is just a renovation, then I must ask, and it's not unique to Redcliffe, what do we do with all these old aging infrastructure schools? Uh, Chris, thank you so much. And yes, a uh, very important question. You know, at what point are they too old? At what point do they need to be um, fully replaced rather than just modernized and updated? Happy to have that conversation with the uh, local school division and uh, get their perspective. And you know, we always work together to see what makes the most sense. Does it make uh, more sense to actually facilitate a complete replacement or, or just a modernization? So happy to have that conversation with the school division and see what works best for the community look at costing and, and make that decision. Uh, as part of the school construction accelerator program, one of the key pillars of that program is uh, modernization and replacement of aging infrastructure. So every year for the next three years, we aim to modernize or completely replace eight uh, projects for a total of 24 over the next three years. Uh, so uh, we want, we recognize that we do have some aging infrastructure in addition to incredibly significant space pressures in the Calgary and Edmonton metropolitan regions primarily, but also in other areas. So we want to make sure we're able to build new schools to accommodate the growth, but also replace, update, and modernize um, some uh, aging infrastructure that we may have in other communities. So we will be uh, prioritizing replacements and modernizations as a key part of this program. Microphone number three, please. Yeah, for Minister Nixon, um, 
seniors housing, specifically SL4. For 10 years, the Drumheller, Tom Zariski, Deputy Mayor, Town of Drumheller. For 10 years, the Drumheller area has been in need of an SL4 facility. This was approved by the NDP government a number of years ago. It was again approved by the UC government, not that recently. Most recently, it was, we were told, no, uh, we can't approve that, and that money was clawed back. When can we expect an SL4 facility in the Drumheller area? Uh Fair question, very specific question. I actually don't fully know that building. One of my staff is gonna come check in with you and we will have a further conversation to supplement this answer in a minute. So part of this is still actually in Minister LaGrange's world as well, where we have an overlap between continuing care and the work that we do in seniors housing. We're gonna have some more to say about that, the minister and I, in, uh, in a few weeks, about the direction that we're headed to bring some of that process together to be what we hope will be a little bit more effective, particularly on the capital side. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, as for your specific project, uh, we will. Uh, one of my guys is coming to you right now, and then we'll try to have a side conversation on the way out, so I can make sure I understand it. Okay. Microphone number four. All right. Ooh, um, I'm Barry Kletke, and I'm um, from my mom, but I am actively the mayor of Troshu. So, in rural Alberta, we're in a crisis with an essential service. The affordability crisis of power and gas has reached a critical point, and I want to share a recent power pit bill with you. I want to make it clear that the issue is not the cost of power and gas. In August this year at my 1,000 square foot business, my actual cost of power was $12.09. However, my total YouTube bill was $175.90. Delivery and transmission costs are out of control. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. uh, Mayor Klecky, I'll uh, I'll take this. Uh, Minister Nudorf is not in, in this session. I don't, I'm not sure if he's in the second session or not. But uh, it's a it's a good question. Um, it's. Uh, Something that I, I know that our affordability minister, who's also the uh, kind of the electricity minister, so that's convenient for this question, uh, is is looking at different ways to uh, make electricity more affordable. And I know you're not talking about the electricity bill. Let's face it, uh, it needs to get from where it's produced to you because you, you, both you and I aren't able to go pick it up. So it does need to get delivered. But however, your question about uh, is the delivery transmission, distribution, and, and uh, production costs reasonable. Uh, open for debate. I'm, I'm not, not going to defend it. It needs to get to you, and, and uh, we need to keep looking at whether that's reasonable. We need to uh, have the, uh, the regulator who uh, either permits these charges to go ahead or not permit them to go ahead to make sure they're doing a good job and not permitting charges that are not reasonable to get it to you. So. Uh, we will, I will pass this on, uh, Mr. Klecki, and uh, if uh, Minister Newdorf's here in the second session, you should ask him. Otherwise, well, I and my staff will pass on to him this question and try to get you an answer from Minister Newdorf's ministry or the minister. Microphone one, please. Good morning, I'm Megan Hansen, Mayor of Southern Lake, also a member of the Alberta Mid-Sized Cities. Alberta mid-sized cities are unique. We collaborate together, share data and best practice, and this allows us to deliver, to deliver more efficient servicing with a thoughtful and purposeful approach to municipal government. People and industries are discovering the benefits, and we are growing at an average of 14% per year. My question is, Minister Nicolatis, last week's announcement regarding new school construction was a great start, and we really appreciate it. But there's a lot of definitions for shovel-ready projects and red tape. Our communities are great at making things happen. However, can you share with us what it means to be shovel-ready? Is that all servicing, including roads and utilities? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, a very important question, and actually I was just talking to my team about this yesterday, and uh, we'll be sending out some more communication to our school divisions and other partners about uh, what exactly these parameters mean and have some more meetings so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, sometimes there could be different uh, opinions and understandings of what shovel ready means. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we're all, we all have a common definition and a common understanding. Uh, broadly, in order for us to be able to move a project forward from planning into design, the, the site needs to be, uh, the, the permits need to be issued, need to be ready, the site needs to be serviced, utilities need to be connected. All of those pieces need to be in place before a project can really move forward to the next stage, which is design. Uh, and, uh, and then subsequently construction. So uh, happy to uh, have a follow-up conversation uh, as well, but uh, do keep a note out or an eye out as we will be providing our school divisions with a little bit more clarity uh, so that we're all on the same page about what it means to be site ready or, or shovel ready and that to ensure that we're all on the same page. Microphone two. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for Minister Schultz. Minister Schultz, welcome to Red Deer, uh, as always. Minister Schultz, this past year, the threat of drought showed many of our members how important sustainable water systems are. The rapidly growing populations of mid-sized cities like my own are stressing our water systems. The province was fortunate this year, but we know that won't always be the case. And of course, it's not just due to population growth. Some of the fastest growing industries require sustainable access to water or other energy sources, be it hydrogen in the north or agri-food here in central Alberta. The economic growth is good news, uh, but it's a challenge. So what plans, Minister, does your ministry have to ensure industry and communities can grow sustainably without hampering our economic growth? Well, thank you so much. That's an awesome question, and it's actually the question that I was hoping to get today uh, because it absolutely is one that's top of mind for communities right across our province. Um, we did, for the most part, uh, obviously not uh, down south, but we received more water than we expected, which was a good thing. Uh, but there was a lot of work that went into uh, planning and coming into those water sharing agreements that we were prepared for whatever uh, we saw when it came to water this year. So for those of you in this room that were part of those conversations, First of all, I just want to say thank you. Um, second of all, we are going to be opening up uh, a broader water engagement. So we've pulled together uh, a water advisory council, and really that started to help us figure out, okay, what do we need to do to make it through uh, what was potentially going to be a significant drought year. Um, that committee uh, has now morphed somewhat, and uh, a great representative from Alberta municipalities is Tanya Thorne. I talk about her all the time when I talk about this water committee. Uh, because I know she's very passionate about it and brings a lot of the perspectives from communities across the province. Paul McLaughlin is also on that committee. We've got representation from irrigation, from uh, energy. We've got indigenous communities represented. And so this, that they've now shifted to help us uh, really focus on what we're going to engage on. It's going to be broad. Um, I think originally my department wanted it to be very narrow and focused on legislation and what my response was was if we talk about the big pieces of legislation and we don't talk about stormwater and wastewater reuse, uh, we will be missing half the conversation and largely what is uh, one of the main issues that municipalities bring to me all the time. So we will be launching those and I want people to know this is not about like throwing out our existing water systems or um, scaling back allocations and reallocating. We respect the system that's in place, but as Premier asked me to do, we've got to maximize our water allocation if we're going to continue to grow, whether that be growing municipalities uh, or whether that be growing industries in er every area of the province. And so I would just say, please uh, stay engaged. There will be sessions for municipalities specifically. Bring forward your ideas, things that don't seem to make sense. You know, yesterday, in a couple of our meetings, we were asked about uh, wastewater treatment. Why do we use fresh waters on our lawns? Great, great questions. Bring those suggestions forward so that we can actually look at that in a comprehensive review um, with then hopefully some longer term solutions in the spring. And of course, all of the learnings from um, the water sharing agreements and those discussions are going to help inform that moving forward too. Thank you. Microphone three, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's always fun. Kathy here, Mayor of the City of St. Albert. My question is for Minister Nixon. 
So we know that your government has prioritized affordable housing. For Alberta's mid-sized cities, this is especially pressing as we're collectively the fastest growing communities in the province. We're doing our part, um, we're doing our best to provide uh, this as fast as we can. We are known for our fast permitting and approval times. And we also, uh, are con we also are concerned about the federal government's lack of dollars coming into Alberta. So we know there's a lot of work to do for low-income and supportive housing across the spectrum for seniors and low-income families. So I'm just curious, with the money not coming from the federal government, how can the provincial government help us, all of us, but especially... I think I got the question, Kathy. Uh, <clears throat> you're correct. I mean, the first thing I think is important to note, that, and I don't think there's enough coverage on it, the federal government has been clear they don't want to invest any money in affordable housing in the context that you're referring to, which would be seniors housing, low-income housing, or, or stuff on the homeless side. Uh, they only want to put their investment into market housing, which is good. We do need that investment in market housing as well to maintain affordability overall in the housing market, but it's a real challenge uh, because that's the position that they've taken. They have said that they will continue to provide accelerator money and other components to try to help with the affordable housing work that we are doing, but they continue to do that based on which of you has maybe a cabinet minister's phone number in uh, Ottawa or some sort of a connection to there and not in any level of a per capita way, which puts particularly small municipalities like yours and those that I represent at a significant disadvantage. You can see the list, almost no money headed out to you, which is why we continue to call for per capita. And with some of the legislation that the Premier just recently passed, we will force them to do so uh, in the future. And we'll have more to say about that because uh, they will have to work with the province on how their money comes into our province going forward. And we'll make sure that small municipalities are not left behind. As for us, we continue with the Stronger Foundations Plan. We have extended that plan for our affordable housing uh, across the province, put more money money into it. We are right now executing that plan, investing $9 billion between now and 2031 with all of our partners, including municipalities. My department right now alone is doing a $1 billion worth, just shy of that, that we announced recently. And when we are done, we are going to create at least another 82,000 households of affordability across the province, while at the same time doubling our construction capacity. I will say this, because I've already taken enough time on that answer. While your community may be good at permits, I'm going to call out, there are some communities that are not. And we are still seeing in some communities sitting on government dollars, multi-million dollars worth of investment for projects, some of them who have not been approved for five years, we will be moving our money as quick as possible to the communities that will get our projects approved and built. And I just let that be a warning for some of the municipalities that are sitting on large amounts of projects. We'll move into places that will build them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Microphone four. Good morning, I'm Shelby Gale, the Mayor of the Village of Huandan. My question is from Education Minister Nicolaides. We have watched year after year new schools built all over the Highway 2 corridor and modernizations made to many more. All the while, rural schools were ignored. In a village like ours, a school is truly the lifeblood of the community. The $8.6 billion school construction accelerator program announced recently is great, but I would like to ask for a commitment of dollars specifically for rural schools, or will these new schools continue to be built at the expense of our rural ones? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, an important question, and uh, we, we do have a, a dual challenge that we need to be able to address. Uh, we have a lot of aging infrastructure in some of our uh, smaller communities across the province, uh, but we also have unprecedented and historic growth pressures in other communities in our province. So we have to try to create a, a balance, and, and that is our objective. We are very much um, interested and, more importantly, committed to building schools in every corner of the province, including in our smaller communities. In fact, uh, just um, 
uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, we announced construction funding for a replacement of the Wainwright School, for a modernization of uh, a school in Tabor, uh, in uh, so modernization in Redcliffe, uh, also modernization in Breton, Barhead, and in many other communities as well. So. Uh, it would, I wouldn't be able to allocate a very specific dollar amount and set it aside for one community or the other. Uh, we have 422 requests for schools uh, that uh, our school divisions have requested of government. Naturally, we won't be able to, to uh, facilitate and build all of them, but we are committed to building schools in our smaller and rural communities while also building schools in our fastest growing communities and larger centers as well. So we aim to do both. That is our objective, and uh, we'll make sure that we deliver. Thank you. Microphone one, please. Thank you. My name is Murtaza Jamali from the town of Westlock and also representing the FCSSAA. Minister Nixon, thank you for your support and friendship. I wouldn't be doing my job on behalf of the 198 FCSS programs that I have the privilege to represent if I didn't ask you this publicly. Lately, the municipalities have been picking up the tab for an FCSS funding agreement that seriously needs some help. Many municipalities are now funding well over their required amounts. This level of funding is placing a burden upon all of us that isn't sustainable and just isn't fair. Will you help us keep these essential programs alive through additional FCSS funding? First of all, I understand that your time is, leadership at FCSS is coming to an end, uh, and I just want to actually ask all the group to give you a great round of applause for all the work that you've done to advocate for FCSS. I, uh, I remain committed, as does the government, uh, to FCSS and to our partnership. I recognize that there are challenges, uh, and we've spoken about them many times. Uh, we'll be having some conversations as we go through the budget process. At the same time, though, I have to be clear, there are challenges all across my ministry. Unprecedented challenges because of population growth, programs that are up uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because of where we're taking place in population growth. And so I have to work through that process with Treasury Board within the parameters that we got. What I can commit is that FCSS is not going anywhere. Uh, but I will be clear, we have some real tough challenges ahead as a ministry uh, to be able to make sure that we can get through this time of population growth and the affordability crisis while still meeting our obligations as a government and to Albertans to be fiscally responsible and balance the budget. So you will have a loud voice during that process, uh, and obviously I can't commit to a funding increase today, you know that, but I will commit that we will continue to support FCSS going forward. Thank you. Microphone two, please. Uh, good morning, ministers. Councilor Courtney Penner from Calgary. This is going to be for Minister McIver. Libraries. Libraries are an essential service in our communities, and they serve everything from early childhood literacy to hubs for seniors to gather. But per capita library funding only saw a five cent increase in 2023, the first of its kind since 2016. And we are still working on data numbers from 2019. So I'm asking not only on behalf of the Calgary Public Library, of which I'm a proud board member, but on behalf of all libraries in this room who I am sure are serving the community as frontline services, supporting other social services, can we have an honest discussion about a commitment to increase funding? And further, I'm going to say, the Calgary Public Library... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just to be clear, that's a question from my municipal councillor. <coughs> I live in Courtney's uh, ward. So uh, anyways, uh, Courtney, thank you for being a uh, supporter and on the library board. Uh, I, I expect probably everybody in this room is a library supporter, if not almost everybody in this room. Uh, 
uh, my objective is not to argue with you, but uh, my recollection, which is imperfect, is that it was a 10% increase in 2023. But I would also acknowledge in saying that was a few years in a row before that without an increase. So I, you're, listen, everybody wants more money, and for good reason. I've always, you know, and, and libraries uh, will make their case for more money too, and I, I support that. So I would. You asked for an honest conversation. I think we have one every day with libraries. I think we have a good relationship with the libraries. Are we perfect? No. Do they want more money? Yes. But the, the, the main thing you asked for is an honest conversation. You're definitely going to get that uh, with, with libraries. And, and we will uh, roll over through all the issues, all the discussions, uh, including money. But uh, yeah, and we just uh, passed a piece of legislation in the last year or so with a whole bunch of stuff. Actually, we tended to do it two years ago, but just couldn't get it in the legislative agenda with a bunch of requests that libraries had that should make some of those things better. But I understand, as you do, there is no finish line. There's an ongoing discussion, ongoing attempts to improve in that honest conversation. The answer to that is a hard yes. Thank you. Microphone three, please. I think it's still morning, so good morning, everyone. I'm Sandy Bainford from the Summer Village of Southview. My question is, is it true that Alberta sent back $130 million to the feds that was supposed to be spent on abandoned oil fields and wells? 